everybody. Welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we're talking to Dr. Joseph Cardello and we're talking about his book, The 12 Rules of Attention, How to Avoid Screw-Ups, Free Up Headspace, Do More and Be More at Work. Here at work. And so in the last segment, um, segment, um, I don't know, this is now segment four, we were talking about how you shift from, you know, a narrow to a wide perspective. Um, we also talked about um, different ways in which your brain um, goes into autopilot and other ways in which our brain kind of does what it, its job, but then also puts us in places where we're less aware. And so I wanted to talk about um, bias, which is just such a, a popular topic nowadays on the work front, um, which is like, what is your bias or systematic <laughs> bias? There's yeah. bias everywhere. Um, so I want to ask you, first of all, um, how is bias and awareness or attention and focus, how are they all related? Well, they all relate in, in this way that, you know, we, some of the things that, that we, some of the terms that we've used and bias is going to be one of them. Uh, and, and, you know, another one is miser brain. Another one is, you know, inattention. And, you know, some of these, some of these terms uh, seem to always have, you know, we, we think of them as a negative thing. Mm -hmm. And, and in, a, in attention science, a lot of these machineries have both, they're, they're, ne they're neither positive nor negative. It depends how the machine is working. And mm -hmm. so, for example, with, with, with bias, you can create a bias to eliminate a bias. <laughs> right. That makes sense. I mean, I can create, like, for example, like if I'm, if I'm, if I'm eating a very unhealthy diet, I can create a tremendous bias by just saying, eat green. Mm-hmm. You know, and right away, I've just eliminated most of the foods that are high in cholesterol right. you know, and, and keeping myself nice and healthy. And so when I go out to a restaurant, I've got a bias that says, you know, I immediately look at the at the menu for for green, for right. green things. So or just, you know, eat healthy or something like that. Right. So all these all these kind of come together, um, all these machineries that we've been talking about and you know, in the form of terms, come together uh, under under the under the umbrella, the 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 machine of attention, which isolates items and details that determine how we think, how we feel, how we act, and how we move. Um, that determine uh, what we're aware of and how mindful we're going to be. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to regulate our attention, which allows us to ch pick and choose. Um, we're trying to regulate our awareness, which allows us to know what's important and stick to it in this sea of detail that we're flooded with every minute. And we're trying to regulate our mindfulness, which will give us the energy to be more present in a situation. And so if, if we use our ability to choose, if we use our ability to be aware so that we can stick to the important detail in a flood of detail, and, 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 and if, we, if we use our mindfulness to boost the spotlight so that we see everything a little clearer and sharper, uh, we're more likely to act and think and feel the way we want mm. in a given situation. Okay, so the, um, and when you read the um, popular press, the idea right now is that there's um, in a lot of our systems, whether they be hiring systems or marketing materials that we actually display to the product, um, to um, Tawi Chess children, um, and place them in schools, um, colleges, and what they do. You know, there's all these biases that are built in. So it's, and I think that there's two levels of biases, right? There's the, the brains of the humans who, you know, made these decisions, which were based on bias. Right. That's and right. then there's the artificial intelligence 
that is computer code that is written based on another level where the computer then takes our human biases and, uh, and applies another system for, for determining who to hire. Because right now, if you go to yeah. most hiring for computer companies, it's all done through algorithms. You know, they, they come up with algorithms to say, yes, this resume, yes, <laughs> yes. that resume, no. You know, this, this student in to Harvard, this student out, you know, it's basically, I don't know if Harvard does that. I'm just making that up <laughs> just, you know, but I know that other companies, high tech companies do the thing that I just mentioned in terms of creating algorithms, deciding you get a loan or you don't get a loan. You know, it's based <laughs> on historical information, um, crime, you know, whether you, you know, there's all this bias with respect to, oh, you know, I, I'm a police officer. I think that that person is more likely to create a crime than not. So they, there are all these biases that are built into our brain, which is hardwired, right? And then, and then those get replicated into AI. <laughs> so help us be aware, like, tell us a little bit about the nature of bias without getting into, like, this is not about politics. It's <laughs> yeah, just right. about, like, the brain. So um, let's say that... Um, there is a bias of some sort. Um, how, how does that enter into the human brain? Um, and then how is that, you know, and I guess, I don't know if you can answer this question, but it seems like it's multiplied or made worsened by the algorithms that the human brain then creates for the computer to then That's determine right. stuff. That's right. And, and the computer really doesn't care where it came from. Yeah. So the computer, it, you know, the computer, you know, that, that's the equation. Big, in, in my book, I write, I write about, <laughs> I, you know, I, I just, I love the humor and attention science. There's so much humor to it, really. We, we almost got to laugh at ourselves every once in a while, you know, like who hasn't gone out to the parking lot and, and uh, almost gotten in the wrong car before, you right. Know, or, right, you know, or gone to the grocery store to buy one item and on your way home, you realize you bought half the store, but you didn't buy the one item. Exactly. <laughs> right. So, you know, in, in my book, I talk about the difference between, you know, uh, you know, electronic, electronic bias and our own. And, you know, for example, Siri makes mistakes too, based on those algorithms that you're right. talking about. In fact, you know, uh, you know, who hasn't, who hasn't asked Siri to, to, to go out and, 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 you know, fetch something works very much like our own attention system, yes. you know, and then comes back with something bizarre, you know, right. and, you know we've all done that. Yes. And, uh, you know, it's because we either fed the information in incorrectly because some, because the microphone didn't work right. I mean, there's all right. kinds of things, but, but one thing I can assure you is that Siri doesn't feel bad about it. Mm. Right. You know what I mean? It's, but we do. Right. <laughs> you know, we do. You know, I come home from work and I say to myself, well, why did I do that again? You know, <laughs> or, right. You so know, you're or, saying there's a combination of the various ways in which our mind works. So there's intention and an inattentional bias or yeah. right, inattention bias, the miser brain, which we had talked about in the part two, I think it is um, those priming. Um, change blindness, blindness, these are all ways in which we, they're a form of bias as well as what you're saying, because our yeah, brain is are. trying to take shortcuts. Like I need to make a decision quickly. So I'm going to take a bunch of data that has been brought up before, and I'm going to assume that this is what I need to do. Yeah. And it's also self-protective. I mean, I, I think that uh, this is, this is a result of, you know, probably evolution, you know, that we, you know, we, we are prone, you know, biases kept us safe. You know, we tried to protect our tribe mm -hmm. um, from outside influence that could lessen our ability to survive. Right. And so I, I think that bias came into play as, a, as an evolutionary sort of pushback Right. Um, to, to something that could could hurt us, but then you know so much that that uh, has a, a potentially good effect um, in attention science, which is what I'm doing, um, also can have a very bad <laughs> effect. Right. The flip side of bias 
is that, okay, so, I'm, you know, I'm trying to maintain my tribe's integrity or my right. own personal integrity. And at the same time, by doing that, I'm excluding some potentially fantastic insights, right. you know, and, and so you, you, you have to make yourself aware of that potentiality on a day-to-day -day basis, really. Right. So you may, you're, so going back to what you're saying, we have the survival instinct, Yeah. But, you know, eat, you know, bear, run, you know, <laughs> right. truck coming to me, run. So those are areas in which this kind of me mechanism in our brain actually helps us um, because we have this coding in our brain that says, if I see this, this is dangerous and I need to run because my survival is at, at, at odds here and I need to protect my tribe. I need to protect me and my family that's crossing the road. Yeah. Um, so, but then there are things um, which I think are being called into question, right? So if, if the banks in the past found that certain people of certain age, race, um, gender, whatever, were bad bets in terms of making loans, those things which were based on a human being making that, um, that change blindness or inattentional blindness or the miser brain or priming, those are all the things that went into that human being making that decision on whether to give you know, an Asian woman a loan. Yeah, and right? these, things, these things happen immediately. Yes. You know? And we can't, you know, we can't always run from everything because we're trying to protect ourselves because right. sometimes, sometimes what we think is a protection is keeping us from growing or keeping us from being happy or being happier. Um, uh, you know, one, so I want to throw a fix in there before we, yeah, yeah. you know, cause we're talking about all the stuff that, you know, that, that really kind of straps us, right. you know, but, but what I, what I want to do is throw this fix in one thing that we could ask ourselves when we're in a situation like that is, this, is the question, why am I thinking like this? Mm -hmm. You know, just to take a second and ask ourselves, why are we thinking like this? And the, and, and, and see if we're being reasonable. Right. You know, and on the other and another question we might ask ourselves, and, and I'm not sure which one is more important at this point. You know, um, another question we might ask ourselves is what what am I what am I risking? By thinking like this, mm. or if I do what I'm about to do. What what am I? What am I risking? Like, for example, if somebody came to me and I'm, I'm interviewing them, this is a, this comes from, uh, you know, a, a colleague of mine's real time experience. If somebody comes to me and, and, and I'm, you know, I'm doing interviews to hire somebody and there's something about that person that turns me off in one way or another. And, and I pause for a second and say, well, wait a minute, why am I thinking like this? And if I see that, that, that there's something missing there. And I ask myself, well, what am I at risk here? You know, mm -hmm. what, what am I at risk for? I might, I might say, well, what, what's at risk is I might not hire, th this person might be the best person for the job. Right. I, I might be missing the best person I could have ever hired. And I had a colleague who actually did that and he attributed it <laughs> to me. I'm glad it worked out, you know, yeah. but, but, but he said, you know, I, you know, I did that. I asked myself, why am I thinking that? And then he traced it back and he goes, I don't like that. I mean, he was a, a sharp individual. He goes, I don't like that, that I'm, I don't like to even be thinking like this, yeah. you know? And, and so he gave it, a, he gave it more time and he, you know, and he, he, he approached the interview differently and he realized this, this is the best person for the job. Yeah. And, and I... he, and he was very happy with the individual, not only, did that change him, but it changed, it changed the way he interacted with people in general. Mm. And, you know, and, and, you know, I got to believe that somewhere in there, you know, it made for a little happier life, you know, mm. I'll tell you my own experience, my personal experience as an Asian American. So on the East coast, I was, when I grew up, I was like one Asian girl among a high school of 
non-Asians. And so then I moved to the West Coast where it's like, I'm like half of the people here are Asian, you know, a lot, I'm not in the minority, like, you know, like this minuscule minority, I'm actually still a minority, but you know, 30% of the people here are Asian, but this is a long time ago, because I'm ancient. But you know, I, when I made that switch, it was just so interesting, because there was a certain mindset when I was one of like, say, probably about a 1000 versus, you know, you know, you know, 10% of, of that, of that population, there was a mind shift. And I also would say that, I mean, sadly, last week there, I was walking across two weeks ago after the shooting in Atlanta, when all those um, older Asian women were, um, you know, just shot at the spas, I um, was walking, I was coming back from the grocery store and I heard a, a noise and I turned and I saw um, this gentleman who actually looked exactly like the shooter, but that I, the picture that I saw of the shooter in Atlanta, right? But this is someone in Seattle who I saw and I instantly crossed the street. Wow, it was yeah, like, it was like a nanosecond. And I thought, wait, why am I even crossing the street? Why am I crossing the street? Is this guy going to shoot me? Basically, the shooter looks like most of the people in Seattle, like long beard white, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the vogue, <laughs> vogue look here in Seattle. So why am I thinking like this? What am I in? And what I was risking is I thought I can't live in fear. I yeah. don't want to like think yeah. of certain people and being afraid of walking back from the grocery store. Like I, I'd rather just be shot than actually be in a life where I'm just constantly worried about someone shooting me and just being paranoid all the time. So that's kind of a real time, really recent example of, you know, where my brain for self-protection and efficiency, I literally, I didn't, I wasn't even thinking, I just crossed the street like that when I saw that guy. Yeah. And I, and I had fear and my body, I was like, oh my God, my heart is be beating really fast. Why is this even happening to me? So I think that that is one way of, you know, working, at least I went through kind of like naturally the kind of same practice that you had just suggested. That's right. Um, so there are a whole bunch of others. So there's the halo effect, bandwagon effect, confirmation bias, optimism bias. What are <laughs> these things and how do they... Are they also things that we need to consider and think and like being conscious and aware of these snap judgments that we make or yeah. things that we do? Yeah. And, and you start to, it, the, the beauty of this is, is that, you know, it's uh, so we're taking this thing called attention and we're breaking it down into all these little parts, awareness, mindfulness, you know, and then, and, and, and then all these other itsy bitsy parts like halo effect and, and so on miser brain. So it, it, when we, when we step back from it, we'll see how it all works together. Yes, and, yeah. and you'll, you'll see how, how, the, the main tools of awareness, mindfulness, attention, visualization, uh, reflection, work to control these things. And that's how you take your mind and use it to control the, 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 the biological mechanisms that are happening in your head and, and uh, hopefully you know, bring them more in sync with, you know, so that we can be more the way we want to be. That the halo effect is, uh, you know, who, who is who hasn't been overconfident about an outcome? Right. Th this is something that that's inborn in us. Right. We, you know, we become overconfident about a particular outcome, even though we know the odds. You know, right. we might we might sit here and say, well, you know, the odds are, you know, one out of every two marriages may break up, but not mine. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to be the one that doesn't, you know, uh, you know, it, it's that kind of thing. And and so we, we also learn to recognize some things that go along with it. I mean, we, we learn to recognize when we're most like that, too. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if somebody's really pumped up. You know, mm. it, if you just won the lottery, you don't want to be going and signing a contract <laughs> right. right after. That. I mean, if you're really pumped up, you might agree to something that, you know, you think is going to be a tremendous outcome. But if you had taken another day or two to look at it, you'd see, well, you know, maybe 
You know, right. maybe, maybe I should have taken my time on that. Um, or just a decision like, you know, I'm going to say this to my partner right now because I'm <laughs> confident that, that he or she is going to take this the way I mean it. Right. <laughs> 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 no, no, right? So I mean, but right, it's like an almost either over underestimation of the risks. It sounds uh, yeah, like, yeah, you know, don't think I'm immune to this, <laughs> right? Either under and underestimate the risk or over glorification of the positive yeah. aspects. Or I'm going to talk to my boss right now about, right. you know, the the extra funding I need or the extra days right. off or the, you know, and 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 she'll understand. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Her, her, you know, I, it has nothing to do with the fact that she's got a line of people waiting outside her office. You know, exactly. I'll, I'll get in that line and she'll understand why I'm here. You know, so this is overconfidence. If we really look at our lives, we can laugh at ourselves. I like to start with that, you know, right. but then we can see where it's really messed us up. Right. Right. And, and so that's where tools like reflection looking at a situation that did me me messing up gives you the opportunity to look into something and 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 where you look so where you shine the flashlight and look is is as important as your motivation to try to fix it mm -hmm. so like when i go upstairs here and start to shine my flashlight i'm looking for you know some of the things that we've talked about and that appear in the book i'm looking where where are those coordinates you know, mm -hmm. I trace back my footsteps and I say, you know, what fired up there? Mm -hmm. You know, and I, and I look at my thoughts. What thoughts was I having when I did that? You know, when I was thinking that this was just the thing to do and that everybody was going to think the same as me. What was I thinking? You know, what memories was I relying on mm -hmm. or what memories was I intentionally ignoring? You know, mm -hmm. like the person, I, and I write about this particular <laughs> individual who would storm into his boss's office mm. and on a Friday because he had the urge to go home and have a great weekend and didn't want anything on his mind. Meanwhile, right. his boss didn't want to see him. Right. You know, so the last experience didn't work out so well, but he conveniently forgot about that <laughs> forgot about that but we all do that you know i mean yeah. I, I, we all do that we you know and and that's one of the, that itself is a, is a form of bias you know right. when you know we we have our own narrative you know mm. this, this is how i got healthy the last time i was sick we just tend to leave out certain details <laughs> right we don't we don't want them there so we tell our story without those details and emphasize the ones that'll support it Right. So um, you talk about this as an optimist. I'm, I'm linking this back to stuff in your book. So optimize, optimism biases has the thinking that we're less likely to experience a negative event or outcome like the guy from Friday. A halo effect is that you see an attractive quality in an in individual and that triggers that you look for others. So we've been talking about optimism bias. Is that Right. Yeah, we've been talking about optimism bias and also, uh, you know, that the halo effect make, makes us pretty confident in an outcome. Like if I see somebody that um, that uh, is, is uh, say, uh, looks the way I like people to look or something, right. you know, I see somebody it, it's actually a very, um, very early form of uh, of empathy. You right. know, like when we're in the schoolyard and we see somebody that looks just like us and we go up to that person, the person doesn't want to play. Right. <laughs> we're, we're learning a very early lesson, like just because they look like me doesn't mean they're going to play with me, you know, right. um, you know, or or I go I go to a small community or, or a large community and I go, wow, this is really a cool place. And I go there and all of a sudden I say, wow, you know, I don't really like what's going on here. Or I right. see a, a college campus that looks quaint. And, right. I, and I, I make the assumption that, that I, I'm confident that the people are going to be. Right. Yeah. You just make an educated jump. Like, yeah. oh, this looks, oh, this looks really nice. I like the brochure, you know, it yeah, looks right. like people exactly. like me are in this college. It's exactly. Uh, so you have a halo effect associated halo effect. with it where it triggers you to, to think positively because you see your tribe there. Yeah, you see, exactly. And then you see your and tribe, then that's a, a halo effect. A, an optimism bias too that makes us think that you know that things are going to turn out all right for me right 
So those are all kind of on the upside, like, oh, that, you know, halo, you can see from the words optimism, they're like a positivity bias. And then there are things like a confirmation bias, which is becoming overly defensive of a potential. Um, so a confirmation bias, you said, is a tendency that makes certain individuals become overly defensive when they're made aware of a potential risk in their actions. Um, so that's kind of... And kind of a negative, and then there's a ban. So, what's tell us a little bit about confirmation bias? Well, what does confirmation, that? The confirmation bias itself, yeah, we do, we do become defensive, <laughs> Be, right? Because we all want to be the person we think we are, and and when something is going on, whether it's another person or a situation, etc., uh, sort of has c- carries the implication that we're not that, right? we don't like it, you know, we don't, we don't like it. Um, And so um, the confirmation bias itself is, is something that makes us stick to detail that confirms who we think we are. It confirms our self portrait. So whatever it is that I think I am. (laughs) All right. I'm going to share a personal experience that I've seen that kind of, kind of, I think that will help kind of what the heck is this and what does it all mean? So um, I was working with um, a group that was, this is early on before diversity, equity, inclusion became a buzzword in all corporations and organizations, but they were kind of a frontier in working with diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so their process at the time, which I think is very familiar with a lot of the ways that people may be doing it now. I don't really know the details, but it's, you know, getting aware of the structural balances, structural systematic biases that are in hiring in your marketing materials, in your website, right? It's how you how how you are talking to other people in a mass yeah. kind of form, right? Or hiring other people, how you're interrelating with people. And I think we've already talked about that. Like, why am I thinking this? What I'm risking, like getting clear with the self-protective mechanisms and and little shortcuts that we've taken, um, especially when they actually bias against certain populations, genders, whatever. Um, and then then what, what was happening was um, they um, were talking about um, the history of um, of racism in America, and they were presenting all these different biases that have come about. And then they started talking about it in a group. And what was happening is the white people were getting triggered because the way that the materials were presented, it made them feel shameful and guilty because it was all like, here's the ways that you've abused me. And then like, you know, all these litany of things. And then, and then what happened was the confirmation bias was like, people were saying, well, I'm not like that. You know, and what I've he- heard, and you, and I think there's a book called White Guilt, or it's called White Guilt. You'll hear people saying, "I'm not like that," or "I have a lot of um, Asian friends, um, <laughs> so I'm okay," or "I would never do that." So this is kind of confirmation bias. And I just yeah. heard from a woman who <clears throat> is African American woman, and she said, "That doesn't help me. Like, I, I need you to admit." that you actually have that we are diff- there are differences and that some people are treated differently because when you actually say that you don't have this then it's denying that this exists for me so that's an example of where confirmation bias um, came into play um, and um, I see the halo effect of like you know so, and, and what happened in this particular instance is that it got so triggering for everyone in this group, this early frontier group, that the white people sat in one group and the people of color sat in another group so that the, there was a tribe and, and safety created for mm-hmm. these two groups then to get together, which then was um, an awful experience, frankly, but it but it, it did create its safety within the tribe of the white people who wanted to talk about and all other people who weren't the white people. So I can see the halo effect, um, um, optimism bias. Well, we're, you know, we're this, you know, very virtuous company. We're not going to have these kinds of things happening, right? So this kind of confirmation bias and the optimism bias happening. Um, and then you have the bandwagon effect where 
you said at times we find ourselves jumping on board when and where most people in our peer group or culture seem to be a, a, a be um opine, you know having opinion on a certain issue oh all uh, the time yeah. yeah and so there and then in this case there was the same kind of scenario where it's like well you know, I think we need to do something and someone would have a really strong opinion, let's say about on the person of color group, and they would have such strong opinions. And then, you know, you have like Asian Americans, African Americans, Hispanics, and you have all these Native Americans all together grouped as a person of color group, each of them with their distinct culture and sense of how to communicate to authority, speak power to truth, like it was just um, and so there was this bandwagon of someone very strongly, adamantly describing something, and then people just like mildly consenting um, for all these things. So this is what I've seen in the world of DEI. So, I mean, how can we look at this information now, know that there are biases, know that our minds have these limitations in certain ways, like it's not meant to harm people, but in the end, even though it's not meant to, it still harms people. Right. So, so what can right. we, so <clears throat> you had said that you're going to put it all together. <laughs> I gave well, you an example. Help me put this well, all together. We, we started, we started the conversation, you know, uh, much earlier. And we, one of the, one of the um, statistics that, that I was discussing was that 82% of people, and this is just at work, you know, 82% of people feel that their greatest talent is left unknown at right. work that people don't recognize that. And, you know, we were talking about how many people, you know, make error at work. Well, it's, it, it, to me, when you start looking at even the statistics, it's not surprising that there's such a, you know, a, an attention deficit all over the place. Um, you know, to get back to the, to the, the um, confirmation bias, uh, you know, when 82% of people feel that their greatest talents are unrecognized at work. I mean, and most of us are at work all day. Right. <laughs> so we're being unconfirmed. Right. All day long. <laughs> you know, and, and, and then just weigh that in with the stress we feel, the anxiety that we feel, the way we feel about ourselves. And what about the way we feel about that institution that, doesn't even recognize our talents, mm. you know? So when you, you put that element together, you know, you start to see all kinds of issues mm -hmm. that you could look at everything from, you know, retention at work, retention at colleges, you know, all that stuff. Um, uh, even even how, how many people take sick days, mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know, mm -hmm. you, you know, how many people, you know, draw on, on, on their insurance policies for mm. things like stress, anxiety, depression, and, and all that, and, and, and how so much of it is related to things that we really could control. And when we look at ourselves too, we'd say, do, you know, in a way, in a way, making ourselves more attentive, and this is the part that <laughs> some people might not want to hear, making ourselves more attentive puts a responsibility on us. Mm -hmm you know, on us for our own person, but also for other people. I mean, you know, when I realize that, you know, there are people in the room with me that, that, that also want to be, have confirmation bias. And, you know, mm -hmm. when I, when I'm, a, when I'm ignoring their talent, when I'm ignoring them, et cetera, or even the language that I use, maybe mm -hmm. I'm not ignoring them, mm -hmm. but maybe the language I'm using is, it, it, it has lost its sensitivity to their, current needs maybe it was okay a year ago but it's not okay now because mm -hmm. somebody feels different now and i should be attentive to that i should put my yeah. spotlight on that i mean what we're what we're talking about really is that attention mechanism is so uh much a part of everything that we feel all day long from the energy that we feel to whether we feel we've had a good day, a happy day. And it, it, it's what helps us control all this. And, mm -hmm. and I guess at the bottom line, you know, my investigation into this material and sharing it uh, with people is, is an effort to, to, to give people a tool to make themselves happier. And it's, it's not a tool that I even have to give them. You already have it. 
you know, right. it's just, how do I use it? You know? And, and so, you know, a way to, a way to the best, the best uh, tools that I have for regulating uh, attention are first uh, to make ourselves, you know, mindful mm -hmm. and, and increase our energy because we have to have enough energy to pay attention. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that, you know, when we get tired, we make mistakes. Mm -hmm. When we get tired, we don't see things that we mm -hmm. need to see. Mm -hmm. You know, it's difficult to locate the truth when there's many details mm -hmm. going on or we're being flung. So if we're tired, we can't really do that. If we're tired, we will, our miser brain will just take over and, and do it for us. Mm -hmm. um, and we talked about what happens then. So first, we, we need to make ourselves mindful, and that is to increase our energy. Mm -hmm. In my book, I've got a lot, a lot of ways to do that. One of the things that I like so much is, 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 is getting in touch with natural sound and mm -hmm. using natural sound as a way to, 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 to uh, change our brainwave activity, change the chemical bursts in our body in order to have uh, you know, a, a, a better energy with which we can pay attention. Um, then I think that reflection, we have to give ourselves time during, 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 the, during the day and especially toward the end of the day to just kind of reflect on things. And sometimes, you know, not everything that happens every day is, is you know, of, um, you know, of dramatic importance. <laughs> You right. know, and, and sometimes we're, we're very happy to have it that way. But every once in a while, there's some big event that's going on in our lives or something we want, we really care about to, mm -hmm. that it works out. Um, and, and we want to put more attention on that. Mm -hmm. and, and if it went awry, we want to reflect at the end of the day. That, that gives us the opportunity to go into our, our hardware and trace the footsteps and find out what were we thinking when this happened? What were we feeling? What emotions would I feel? What, what memories were opening up? Uh, mm -hmm. That kind of thing. You know, mm -hmm. what, what actions did we see ourselves doing right before we did whatever we did? Mm -hmm. um, and, and trace those and, and ask ourselves some, some questions about that. Like, is that the way I want it to be next time? Um, mm -hmm you know, is that the way I expected myself uh, to be feeling and thinking and acting? Um, is that the way others expected me to be feeling and thinking and acting? Um, you know, is, is that the way I, I feel best acting in that situation? And what would I change next time? Mm -hmm. If I if I ask myself some of those questions, they might help me create uh, new neural coordinates mm -hmm. that that I can then visualize myself. So I'm going to go from reflection to visualization. And again, in all of this, I'm going to increase my mindfulness, which to give a metaphor would be like increasing the wattage of the spotlight that I'm using to observe uh, the details. And now I'm going to do a visualization in an experience that I might have in the future. It could be tomorrow or it could be just someday. Um, and, and how I might want to act in a similar situation with the edits that I'm going to make. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to visualize that activity and how I can do that. And in order to do that, I'm going to, I'm going to be looking again at myself internally, mostly. Um, I'm going to look at my thoughts, my memories, my feelings, uh, the behaviors that I, I see myself doing. Um, and then I'm going to look at my external environment too. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say, is there anything in the external environment that would impede that? Mm -hmm. You know, like, uh, let's say I say to myself, well, you know, I need to have more energy in a situation or I need to have more positive energy in a situation. Is there anything in the external environment that might be affecting that? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've looked at myself internally, maybe a memory, mm -hmm. maybe I'm bringing a memory into it that shouldn't be there. And so I need to tell myself, well, you know, the individual that I'm about to deal with is not the individual that I dealt with before. 
Mm. You know, so I can't expect it to be the same. So I'm bringing a bias into the situation. Mm. I'm, I'm saying, well, the last time I treated somebody this way, it didn't work out. So I'm not going to do that with this individual. Well, how do you know? Right. You know, you don't mm. know, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so I don't want to bring a bias into this. And, and, and I need, I need to work that out in the visualization. And, 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 and I need to look at the external environment as well. Is there anything there that's triggering, you know, bad vibes in me? Is, right. is there anything that's depleting my energy? Is there anything that's stealing my focus so that I can't focus on the things that I need to focus on? So mm. once I, I, I do my reflection, I see what went wrong. Then I do the visualization and I see myself at you know, acting and thinking and feeling the way I want to, then I can see if there's anything in that that needs to be tweaked. Mm -hmm. And, and, and then I have to repeat that visualization. I have to, you know, train it like I would a muscle. Mm -hmm. I have to train it. And what I'm doing by training, by repeating the visualization, see, some people tell me, oh, you know, I did that and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, how many times did you do it? Well, I did it the night before, or right. I did it the week before, but, but you need to do it as much as you'd need to do it in, in, in real time to develop a habit. So you, what you're doing is you're developing a habit that would have occurred in real time, but you're doing it up here. And as far as your brain's concerned, it doesn't care if you're doing it in real time or if you're doing it up here. This is one of the great things about attention and visualization. If you're doing it up here, you're going to create the same exact coordinates if you did it live. Mm -hmm. Athletes know this. <clears throat> if you're trying to hit a certain pitch, if you visualize it and visualize it and visualize it in real time, you'll do it. Um, so you have to do the visualization often to, to create the new template. And what happens is you're going to mess up. It's not magic. And then other people say, well, you know, I did that. I did it often and it didn't turn out right. Well, you're going to mess up. And the reason you're going to mess up is because you're already wired to do it another way. Right. And then there are all these different scenarios, right? Like worked with this person, didn't work with this situation. Right. So it's like, there are lots right. of variables that are changing with That's your right. execution every time. Okay, and then what's after after visualization? Well, what you're doing, what you're doing is you're weakening. You're going to weaken that old circuit, mm -hmm. the, the old template that you have, because you keep relying on this new one. And again, you're talking to your brain. You're telling your brain, "I'm creating a pattern here. It's a mental pattern at first, and now I'm creating it in real time when I'm with people, and this is the way I want to be in this particular instance." here's how I want you to act and you keep repeating it, then eventually the old pattern will weaken. You'll mess up less. And eventually the old pattern will go away and the new neural coordinates will take over. And that's what you want. So from the very beginning of, of my book and my theory really is what we're doing is we're going to get rid of these neural coordinates, we can't get rid of them all because we'd be here forever. We're going to get rid of the ones that are messing up important things in our lives. Right. The zombie so, state, you know, the neural yeah. coordinates that snap to the place that you snap to without really unconsciously snap to That's without right. thinking. So the first thing we need to do is find them. Right. We need to find them. What messed me up? Then right. we need to weaken them. We need to make them go away by offering a new pattern, which suits us better, that we're happy with, that gives us good results, and get rid of the old. And right. in order to do that, we need to get, we need to increase the spotlight so that we can really look at this under a microscope, so to speak. We need to increase our awareness because that will allow us to stick to the detail that we choose because we think it's more beneficial. It will give us more stickiness to that detail and make us attentive to it when it comes up in real time. That's what we've said awareness will do. And then we need to use our attention to literally select that detail. We want to be that way. And then once we do that, often enough, we will have created our own zombie. 
and we won't have <laughs> our new keep... zombie right and what is the I've... frequency and duration like how often like we had talked about music like three times a day for 15 minutes like what's the frequency duration and term that you would well, recommend well well first of all that new that i i, I got to go back to that zombie that new zombie that we created see what we did is we took the negative effect of zombies and now we're going to use the zombie we're training that zombie to work for us right so now what happens see zombies can be great because it's like the baseball pitcher doesn't or the baseball batter that doesn't have to think about hitting the ball anymore mm -hmm. because you you've got a zombie in there it's going to do it for you right yes right i love it yes that's what you want and so now that 96 percent of autopiloted behavior some of it which was really messing us up we've gotten rid of those zombies and we put our own team of zombies in there to <laughs> <laughs> to, to become part of that 96% automatic behavior. We don't have to think about it anymore. Right. So now I can go in with confidence to a meeting and behave the way I've chosen to behave. And I don't need to pay attention to it. I can use my attention and my mental energy and reserves for other things. Mm -hmm. Some of which will be to make me happier. Right. <laughs> you know? So, you know, that that's how, how that's done. But I think that the duration uh, may, be, may be different from one individual to another, but it's just like developing a habit, you know? Okay. Like, so for example, let's, so, so, so I'm just going to throw out things and you tell me just, so it could be like what they say in concentration practice and meditation, it's better to do 10 to 15 minutes of high quality concentration three times a day than do one 30 minute meditation. Okay, so that's one kind of concept that's rattling around in my head. The other thing that they say in coaching is that in order to change a behavior, it usually takes three months of yeah, actually yeah. trying yeah, and to that's do it. Ab absolutely correct. So, so, and, and I, it kind of depends on the behavior, right? Like I'm controlling, all right? That's something I've worked on for the last 20 years, right? So I'm less controlling, but I'm less controlling than I was, but I'm still a little bit controlling, right? So this is my issue, but that's over a lifetime, right? But then there are things like, I say, um, you know, I do that all the time. I haven't retrained myself, but I could retrain myself probably for a small thing like that. And that could take three months. I don't know. Do you have a, do you have any heuristics on uh, frequency duration yeah. term? Yeah, your three months is exactly right. That's, that's exactly what, what my research and people I've worked with research comes up with. It's three months. Um, so the, the positive side, well, the positive side of that is, is if you if you try, let's say you try to to, to medicate yourself into feeling better. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you take a medication, uh, it, it's you're going to get a result instantly. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, pretty instantly. That's 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 why pharmaceuticals can be good mm -hmm. because some people need an instant. Yeah, result. Yeah, if I have a headache, I want to result pretty right. soon. Yeah. That's right. Uh, you know, so you need an instant result. On the other hand. Um, some of some of the mind body techniques, some of the holistic techniques that we talk about, you'll get a positive effect, a small, tiny, itsy bitsy positive effect right away. Hmm. Something, but maybe not. But 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 if you get, you might get some small thing right away. Um, some people might get a large effect right away, but most people get a little bit right away. And hmm. and and of that, most people they give up. They say, oh, well, I'm going to give up on this because if I took a pill, it'd go away immediately right? or it would change immediately. But what happens is once you start to train something psychologically and then that psychological training, the way the, the way we've been talking about this now, the model is that we start training it psychologically. So I'm using the mind to train this psychologically in a specific situation that is annoying to me or that I want to improve then that starts to have a biological effect. Mm -hmm. And that biological effect is gonna be very small at first. Now, it doesn't work like a pharmaceutical, but little by little, in about two to three weeks, you're gonna feel a strong effect hmm. in two to three weeks. And mm -hmm. in three months, it's gonna be long lasting or permanent. Mm 
Hmm. It could be, it can be permanent hmm. in three months, the effect. So here's how I look at it. <laughs> if, if your listeners, and, and I practice this myself, at least I try, if you take, make a list, here, here's something I've got to get under control in my life. I have, this is the top of my list. Make a list of the first five things you really got to get in control and go at them first because you, you can't control everything 24 seven. We can't, we just can't. So if there's an important event, you know, if I'm the, if I'm that guy that, that, that stops into my boss's office every Friday and I got to stop doing this, if I want to keep my job, you know, I've got to control that. <clears throat> then that's the thing I want to go after. And, and, and of course, at first, you're going to have to work very, pretty hard at it because it's very foreign to the way you behave. Same here, very foreign. But we want to fix it. We're motivated to fix it because we want to live the lives we want, because we want to, have, we want to, we, we want to confirm the profile that we want, and we want to make it better if we can. Right. Um, as good as we can, you know? Right. Uh, so, so at first it's going to be hard. You'll see some small results. And then when the, within two or three weeks, you'll start to gain that control that you want. And in three months, you can make that permanent. And at any time in that process, you can edit it. And now that's the beauty because now, now you've got something that has literally changed your behavior, your disposition, your attention. You've changed yourself biologically without medicine. Mm. And, and how, that's uh, important. Yeah. And how many, how often a day? So I use the example of like 15 minutes, three times a day, or better to do 45 minutes at a go. Do you have an opinion on frequency timing and duration of this reflection and visualization? Well, I think uh, that's a great question. I, I think that I'm going to take a cop out first. <laughs> I'm going to say okay. it depends on the individual, obviously. Right. But, but I think that starting out small and then increasing to your level of comfort is what you want to do when you're doing reflecting or meditating mm -hmm. or anything like that, you know, you know, I might tell somebody, listen, you know how great it is to be able to meditate for an hour? Right. You know, but if I tell somebody who's just going to go do this tomorrow, I want you to meditate for, for an Five hour. Five minutes. Yeah, no, yeah, not going to work, right. It's not going not gonna to work, usually, you know, but so if you start small and little by little by little, build it up. That's why I say pick one thing you really want to control. Mm -hmm. Start to apply everything to it. Go slowly. Don't expect a miracle the first day because what you're trying to do is you're trying to use your mind to literally change the biological functions and electrical functions of your body. Now mm. think about it. I mean, really think about it. If I sat here and told you you could do that overnight, I, I wouldn't be happy with myself. Right. Because, I mean, think about what you're trying to do and in that context. And so if you think about three weeks, isn't bad. Yeah. To, yeah. And that's to be feeling a, a, a daily, major effect. Daily, once a week, or as much as you can. As much as you can. And then, and then I think, well, no, you don't want to become compulsive about it. You don't want to become that. I mean, you know, as, as much as you need. As right. But how do, what, what's your going in recommendation once a day? Well, I, th I think we should reflect once a day. Okay. I'm I just, think we should, yeah. yeah. People who are like, just tell me how many calories I should reflect, consume, right? Ref yeah, reflect re once a day, 10 reflect, minutes to start off with. Reflect at the end of the day and then follow it up with a brief visualization for any changes you want to make in the footsteps that you trace that were responsible for your day. And okay. then, and then, uh, and then do a visualization, right? You know, use the visualization to make the changes. And then if you want, it, it, say it's something you're trying to change within your next day at the, the, you know, sometime the next morning when you're, you're feeling pretty good, do a visualization of that, you know, got quick it. visualization. Yeah, so five minutes. Remind, yeah. yeah. So that you remind yourself. Okay. Got it. We have a plan. <laughs> That's the plan. <laughs> 
You're so wonderful. We've been talking to uh, Dr. Joseph Cordell. I loved how you weaved all of together the 12 rules of attention, how to avoid screw ups, free up headspace, <laughs> do more and be more. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you.